Until recently, this was the top of the Soviet line, the Soviet T-62. If we had to go to war today, you would see more of this tank than you'd ever care to. The T-62 weighs 37.5 metric tons. It's 9.3 meters long and 3.3 meters wide. With a 115 millimeter smooth bore main gun, this gun is stabilized and has a bore evacuated two thirds up the barrel. The T-62 has a V-12 diesel engine that puts out 580 horsepower and a road range of 450 kilometers. The tank is fully tracked, has five road wheels and no track return rollers. It carries a snorkel and smoke generating equipment. And both the commander and gunner have infrared searchlights. The basic load is 40 rounds, HE frag, heat, and a hypervelocity armor-piercing fin-stabilized discarding sable round with a muscle velocity of 1,615 meters per second. This round is accurate out to a maximum effective range of 1,600 meters. But as always, the Soviets aim to put you on the spot. Since the early 1970s, they have been building two newer tanks, the T-64 and the T-72. Both the T-64 and T-72 are faster, more mobile, and have better protection and a bigger gun than anything we may have encountered in a medium tank. So let's take a good look at them, see how to spot them, check their combat capabilities, and then review some ways that we can fight them and win. This is a model of the T-64. An important recognition feature for the T-64 is the suspension system. It includes six small stamped all-metal road wheels and four track return rollers. The T-64 is the first Soviet medium tank on which this arrangement appears. The probable torsion bar suspension and small wheels contribute substantially to improved cross-country mobility and agility. The track design differs from that of the T-62 in that two live rubber bush pins are used to link track blocks together, not one as in the T-62. The Soviets, by going to a live track system in place of the old flat track, have accepted the need for better maneuverability in the field. Another radical change in this tank is a new engine. The T-64 features a five-cylinder flat pack engine which contributes to a low tank profile. The T-64 engine turns out from 700 to 750 horsepower in a tank weighing 38 metric tons. The tank is thought to have a speed of over 60 kilometers per hour and a road range of 450 kilometers. Its length is 9.1 meters and width is 3.4 meters, a bit shorter and a bit wider than the T-62. Location of the gunner's IR searchlight is to the left of the main gun, not to the right, as in the T-62, an important recognition feature for the T-64. In the T-64, the anti-aircraft machine gun can be fired while the tank commander is buttoned up. Another difference is that the T-64 uses two snorkels, one for the turret and the other equipped with an elbow for attachment to the engine exhaust. In the T-64, small arms ammunition and storage boxes are mounted around the sides of the turret. The Soviets also produce a command version of the T-64. There is no anti-aircraft machine gun. Ammo boxes are moved aft, and a five-meter antenna on top of the turret augments the single-whip antenna. But this five-meter antenna generally is wired to the ground, immobilizing the command vehicle. The antenna storage tube is located with the snorkels. Given its expected position in the battle order, you are not likely to see much of the Command T-64 until you have overrun their positions. But air and artillery sure would be interested in getting on it fast. Destroy command and control, and you've gone a long way toward winning the battle. As of the early 1980s, the T-64 shows up only in Soviet ground forces at home and in Soviet ground forces in East Germany and Hungary. That's a quick look at the T-64. Now let's go to the T-72. There are more of them, and they have been fielded to Warsaw Pact and Third World nations. 
As far as capabilities are concerned, however, you may think of both tanks as a single entity. Although the T-72 uses many proven components, it is a considerable improvement over the older tank series and represents a major change in Soviet tank design. On the automotive side, the T-72 uses a more powerful supercharged V-12 engine but delivers 780 horsepower and moves the tank out at 60 kilometers per hour over a road range of 450 kilometers. The T-72 weighs 41 metric tons, three tons heavier than the T-64. With the gun forward, the tank is 9.2 meters long and 3.5 meters wide. The turret roof is only 2.3 meters high, not much more than man high, and lower than the M1 turret roof by 75 millimeters. The suspension system of the T-72 provides important recognition features. Six large die-cast road wheels with rubber tires, evenly spaced, and a torsion bar suspension system with three-track return rollers, enabling increased road wheel travel as compared with flat track systems and a much smoother ride. Track width is wide compared to U.S. tanks, giving the tank a low ground pressure. The track is steel with a single live rubber burst pin, an improvement from earlier Soviet designs. All these changes provide increased cross-country mobility. Now let's look at the hull-related recognition and functional features unique to the T-72. The tank has a 12.7 millimeter anti-aircraft machine gun atop the turret, a newly designed weapon, but in the T-72 it cannot be fired while buttoned up. In this tank, the gunner's IR searchlight is located to the right of the main gun, the usual position in Soviet tanks, but it's a useful recognition feature because it helps you distinguish between the T-72 and the T-64, where the IR light is to the left of the main gun. Another identifier for the T-72 is a single snorkel tube carried on the left side of the turret. Streamlined fenders are good identifiers for the T-72. They carry supplies, and the right fender carries some of the basic fuel load in fuel cells. So much for features unique to the T-72. The tank also displays many features common to both the T-64 and the T-72. In both tanks, there is a self-entrenchment device beneath the glacier's plate. One sure identifier for both tanks is the sharply sloped glacier's plate with its V-shaped water and debris deflector. In earlier Soviet tanks, glacier slope angle is about 60 degrees from the vertical. That angle in the T-64 and T-72 is nearly 70 degrees, a factor that contributes to frontal armor protection. Here's why. Even if armor thickness is the same as in previous tanks, by increasing the angle, protection is improved in T-64s and T-72s due to the longer path length that must be traveled by a penetrator. The Soviets have also taken other steps to increase armor protection. Track shields are available that extend from the hull, and full skirt protection is likely for the purpose of defeating both heat rounds and ATGMs. The net effect of this is greater armor protection in the front of the hull and turret. The T-64 and T-72 also feature nuclear biological chemical protection by means of positive pressure air filtration and a radiation shielding liner. Both tanks can cross trenches 2.7 meters wide, or depths of 1.4 meters, and snorkel up to 5 meters. When you start talking armament and ammo, you're talking a whole new ball game in these two tanks. The 125 millimeter smooth bore main gun has a bore evacuator midway on the tube and thermal sleeves that indicate greater attention to main gun accuracy at long ranges. While limited to a depression of only five degrees, the gun is stabilized and this along with improved sights markedly increases effectiveness of fire. Basic load for both tanks is 39 rounds. Loads include high-explosive fragmenting, high-explosive anti-tank, and hypervelocity armor-piercing discarding sable rounds. All are fin-stabilized. Adoption of heavier ammunition caused the Soviets to go to separate powder cases and projectors. 
the powder case burns up, and in the T-72, the case stub is automatically ejected aft, as we see here. In the T-64, the stub returns to the autoloader. Taking a close look at the armor-piercing discarding sable round, an additional charge packed around the penetrator helps give this round its high velocity, which is nearly 1,800 meters, or more than a mile per second, giving a 50% probability of a first round hit within 2,000 meters. Penetration capability for the kinetic energy high velocity round is in excess of 300 millimeters of armor. The heat round is capable of penetrating in excess of 475 millimeters of armor. Both the T-64 and the T-72 are also equipped with a PKT 7.62 millimeter coaxial machine gun. These tanks also have smoke capabilities by way of engine exhaust thermal generators and other methods such as externally mounted smoke barrels and smoke grenades. The Soviets have rearranged all tank internals so that all crew functions can now be served by three men, including tank commander, gunner, and driver. The loader has been replaced by an autoloader mechanism. The driver in these tanks is located on the midline forward of the turret, while the tank commander is at the right and the gunner at the left in the turret. Although these tanks have been considered small and cramped, the Soviets limit tank crews to five feet six inches, so interior space is not a serious issue. Stabilized optics, gun and automatic loading features afford a firing rate of six to eight rounds per minute in automatic mode. That's a quick rundown on the T-64 and T-72 tanks. Now to summarize. These tanks are faster, more maneuverable, have greater protection as to armor and survivability in NBC environments, have a bigger gun and higher velocity munitions, improved anti-aircraft capability. They can move through and underwater with improved snorkeling ability. And they can fight at night. However, both the T-64 and T-72 have some weaknesses. So let's take a look at them and see how you can use them to your advantage. IR capability has not been improved, and effective range is still limited. All automated features, stabilized equipment, for instance, are maintenance intensive. In general, maintenance takes longer to accomplish than in our tanks. Also, the use of a standard transmission, a weak spot in the T-62s, may not have been corrected. Manual operation of the anti-aircraft gun in the T-72 exposes the gunner to attack. Engine compartment and tracks in both tanks are vulnerable on the flank, from the rear, and from above. But stowing fuel externally does not materially increase vulnerability to destruction by fire due to the high compression and high heat required to ignite diesel fuel. Auxiliary fuel carried in barrels at the rear will be removed prior to entering combat. Armor below the tank is thin in both tanks. Belly him up by obstacles, or catch him cresting a ridge, and you've got him. No matter which tank you come up against, the T-64 or the T-72, the threat is about the same. Both tanks may be seen in Soviet ground forces in East Germany, among Warsaw Pact allies, and elsewhere in Third World forces. However, only one type of tank will be found in the regiment. Appearance of either tank in replacement for the other will indicate that different units have been committed. As always, both tanks will fight as part of a combined arms team supported by artillery, rockets, tactical air, helicopters, ATGMs, and motorized infantry. Because the Soviets are known to be beefing up tank support in their motorized rifle regiments, up from 31 to 40 tanks per battalion, tank density on the modern battlefield will be higher than ever before. In the offensive, tank guns may be used in the artillery role at extreme ranges, delivering suppressive fire with HE frag rounds directed at our tanks, ATGMs, observers, and infantry. HE frag rounds are a threat because they can damage a tank's exposed components such as tracks, optics, and antennas. Closer in, they will resort to direct fire with kinetic and chemical energy rounds and coaxial machine guns. Tank forces will be traveling online, buttoned up for NBC protection. A 
approaching at high speeds, firing at high rates, with improved accuracy from a more stable platform, T-64 and T-72 tanks offer a serious challenge. In the face of this, we can counter the threat by tactics and flexibility. Go for crossfire, the flank and rear shots. Your turret traverses faster than his. Catch him with his main gun at the wrong angle. Keep moving. Use every bit of cover you can find to present him with the smallest possible target. Use smoke to defeat his electro-optics, both thermally generated and by grenade launchers. Nail him when he's belly up. If you can't kill him, disable him so that teamwork can finish him off. Keep that T-72 anti-aircraft gunner buttoned up. Make the job easier for attack helicopters. If you catch him snorkeling, mark off those snorkel tubes or explode rounds in the water. Let overpressures work for you. It's been said that the T-64s and T-72s are among the best medium tanks in the world today. But they can be defeated. 